I'm sure you've enjoyed this morning because I've been listening the entire time in the background and you've had really two phenomenal presentations. Interestingly enough, I am going to finish in a very different way. Both my good friends and colleagues spoke to you about restoring teeth, using materials, cementing crowns, prepping teeth, finishing teeth. Well, I'm going to talk about everything that happens before, how the process gets there. And I will not talk about a handpiece, a drill, a white stripe diamond or a yellow stripe diamond, but the ingredients that hopefully we can change the caries process from a destructive one to a manageable one. And this is something that we deal with every single day in our practices. So every day, somebody's walking in with holes in their teeth, problems with their teeth. And traditionally, what we've done as dentists is we fix the problems. It's what we do. I want to open your mind today on thinking and looking at things a little bit differently. And this is a topic very near and dear to my heart, because as I teach my younger associates to think differently, it begins to frame the way they will practice for many, many, many years. So obviously, I want to thank GC for doing this and Catapult for hosting this. And I like friends. So please feel free to friend me on Instagram at Vino Dentino, because there I talk about some of that cool technology that Peter was talking about, but I mix in some great tips about my other passions, which is wine and Napa wine. So Vino Dentino on Insta. So here's our dilemma. And this literally happened this week. I get a text from a dentist. She's a young dentist. I mentor some young dentists. And she's working as a GP in an ortho practice. He has two GPs working in the practice. You're in a town, there's not a lot of orthodontists there. And says to me, what do I do with this person? He's 15 years old and his oral hygiene isn't bad. But this is what it looks like. And if we look at the radiographs, you not only see already existing extensive dentistry, stainless steel crowns, that somebody did on molars, but you see incipient to advanced decay, both in the anterior and the posterior. Now, one could take one path in this case and say, what's the big deal? Go ahead and fix it. And obviously that has to get done. The problem is this child's already been fixed and needs more fixing. So while we're fixing the immediate issues, which we have to do, there's no question, we also need to think, how do we prevent this child from getting to this when he's 28 and 30 and 35 years old? Because we understanding the decay process and how things break down is extremely critical to the long-term success of patients' mouths. So whenever somebody comes in, and I'm gonna take you back one like this, whether it's a child or adult, the last thing that I do is say, no big deal, let's just fix these, we'll do 20 restorations, and we're gonna be done. I want to try to figure out why. Because unless this child, and he's not, this young adult who's 15, from a lower socioeconomic status with zero dental IQ, unless that person is from there, most 15 year olds today should not be walking into your practice with 30 surfaces or 12 surfaces of decayed teeth and stainless steel crowns and endos and so on and so forth and decay in the anter lower anterior. It just shouldn't be today. So I need to know why. So this young doctor gets me on the phone and says, what do you think? And I said, well, you got to start asking questions. She says, well, I ask questions and his oral hygiene isn't bad. It's really not terrible. His gums aren't bleeding. It's not bad. So what I said to her at that point, I'm relaying this conversation because I want you to understand the way I think. What I said to her was, that makes me even more concerned that his oral hygiene is not bad. There's got to be something contributing to this. So now we have to know the contributing factors and initially begin to ask the parent. So we have a 15 year old male. The mother claims there's absolutely no medications involved. 
He does drink soda, orange juice, hot cocoa, and Gatorade multiple times a week, but his oral hygiene is, fa- is fairly good. Will this happen just from drinking those drinks? It's possible. It's not totally likely. So we need to ask further. Whenever the mother will say to me, there's no medications, my next question is, there's nothing? Are you sure there's nothing? Because sometimes parents don't want to tell the whole story, especially if they're from either a certain ethnic population where they think it's taboo to tell certain things or they're secretive or more reserved. They may not want to say. So I may have to ask that question three times. You sure no medications? Nothing. Nothing, There's no, no problems at all. They say nothing. I stop. Next undiagnosed problem contributing to the caries process is undiagnosed gastric reflux. Rule of thumb, I see an adult or a young adult come in with a variety of class twos that are starting way subgingival with clean surface occlusals. The first thing I'm thinking of is reflux. And you'd be surprised how much undiagnosed reflux exists, not only in the adult population, but also in the teenage population. Reflux will be the killer of your dentistry time and time again. Beautiful dentistry has met its match with severe reflux. I restored a beautiful case on a woman five years ago, crown and bridge, full upper, x-rays of every margin, everything looks perfect, equally gingival margins. Five years later, black lines around margins, three or four crowns replaced. She was diagnosed with reflux two years ago, and it will destroy teeth. So don't ever underestimate the power of reflux. Parents' history to dentists. How often do we hear, oh, my husband has the worst teeth? It's always the husband's fault when the mom comes in. So heredity and genetics do play an important role. We'll talk about that in a second. Notice I say diet near the bottom and oral hygiene near the bottom. Yes, it's important. But how many of our patients have lousy oral hygiene and a mediocre diet and still don't get a bombed out mouth of cavities? I almost think of it like the California wildfires. When those areas get dry, a little spark's gonna set off everything that's going on. So a little spark in a bad environment can cause trouble. We need to know that dental caries is a multifactorial disease like we discussed. Genetics, diet, medication, oral hygiene, stress, all play an important component. There's over 40 strains of bacteria that contribute to the disease. Now, years ago, when I was in dental school at the University of Buffalo, we were taught strep mutans and lactobacillus, strep mutans and lactobacillus. Control those, you win the war. Doesn't work that way anymore. Just doesn't work that way. Genetics, always ask the parents who's got lousy teeth because genetics, study genetic statistics show about a 35% correlation if mom and dad have lousy teeth, to the kids having lousy teeth. Medication. We were taught anything that dries the mouth has the potential to change the flora and cause disease. Now you're gonna be taught something different. Any medication that affects the body in any capacity has the ability to affect the mouth in some capacity. We were taught it was the anti-anxiety meds, maybe the blood pressure meds for gingival inflammation, the calcium channel blockers. But the list now is, and this is a small subsection of over a thousand medications that are known to cause dry mouth alone. And here's a small subsection, antihistamines, antidepressants, antipsychotics, Parkinson's disease medications, lung inhalers, Alzheimer's disease medications, seizure meds, Acne meds, narcotics, antispasm, blood pressure. This is one subset. So forget the subset. Use your rule. Any medication a patient can take can affect the mouth. If they're on a cocktail of medication, you got to be worried that their dentistry is going to go south. At least you have to be aware of it. It may not, but you have to be aware of it. And it's an easy fallback. Are you taking any new medications? You have a new anti-anxiety med. That happened to me this week in the office. Patient long-term patient of mine. She walks in, she hasn't had dental work in five years. Something's changed. First thing I'm asking is reflux. Nope, no reflux. 
You taking any new medication? Well, yeah, I, I'm taking uh, something for anti-anxiety. I started about nine months ago. She goes, but I have to take it. I can't function. I said, I understand. We got to figure it out because now your mouth is bombed out because everything is going south. If we look at bacteria and the bacterial theory of strep mutans and lactobacillus, this is a study that's now about seven, eight years old, but even back then, they started realizing that carious lesions have an extraordinarily diverse ecosystem where strep mutans only accounts for a tiny fraction of the bacterial community. So now when you walk through a trade show and someone says, I have a rinse, it's gonna target strep mutans and lactobacillus, you know it's not enough. It's gotta target a plethora of bacteria. In this study, which I found really interesting, and, and one of my friends, Kim Cooch, did this study, who owns Carry Free, a great company that has anti-cavity rinses and gels. Strep mutans was the dominant species in many, but not all subject with caries. Elevated levels of strep salivarius, strep sobrinus, and strep parasoguinus were also associated with caries, especially in subjects with no or low level of strep mutants suggesting these species are alternative pathogens. So we know that we have to treat a wide array of bacteria to control disease. Now, if you think about what I'm saying is, I'm taking the most complex concept that we have in our profession, that we routinely, me too, dumb down every day because we fix teeth. And I'm bringing you back to dental school and telling you, how complicated this really is to understand and conquer. And I've shared this with people over the years. And typically what I'll get back right at the break on a program, they'll say to me, you know, I never thought of it that way. But now that you're telling me this week, I had a patient so-and-so, 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 so-and-so. And that's the goal of this. I want you to think differently. Because as you see here in the screen, things are not always what they seem. Rule of thumb, camera rule, things are not always what they seem. What about what we're bringing into our body? How can we help or hurt ourselves? We talked about food and things like that and stuff like that. And we look at certain things that drinks, sodas, things like that. We know that the critical pH, the pH where the mouth needs to be, in order not to have breakdown of enamel, needs to be really between above 5.3. So the critical pH sits around 5.3 to 5.5. Once we get below 5.3, we will then begin to see breakdown of enamel. If we look at the drinks that people are ingesting, things like Coke, Diet Coke, I'm sitting here drinking the Coke, lemon iced tea, Coke has a pH of 2.5. Cherry Coke, 2.5, RC Cola, 2.3, battery acid, 1. Put that in perspective of what our population is ingesting. So our teeth are pretty tough because this is happening every day and everyone's mouth is not bombed out. And the reason is because that critical pH is higher. Again, more food for thought. Your 25-year-old patient that comes in never had a cavity in their mouth. They drink sodas all day long. Why? They have protective saliva. The pH is high. Rule of thumb is you get someone into their 25s, late 20s plus with no cavities, unless they have a life-changing event, they will likely never have a cavity their entire life. Meaning on a bunch of medications, chemotherapy, radiation to the head and neck, you get them through early, they have protective saliva, they're going to cruise. Those are the ones that will show up with undiagnosed gum disease but they'll cruise when it comes from a carrier's perspective. But here's where we become stupid. The dentist becomes stupid because we don't know. And if we look and we see what we're prescribing for our patients, what we're telling our patients when they say, doc, once, what should I rinse my mouth with? And you say to them, you know, use Press Pro Health. It's a great product. pH is 4.27, it's acidic. Use the all natural one, Dr. Tom's of Maine. It's great for you, it's all natural. 
pH of 3.89. It just doesn't make sense to put an acidic product into an acidic environment if we want to raise pH to become healthy. There are good things out there. Smart mouth, pH of 7.1. ACT, anti-cavity fluoride risk, 7.95. And it has fluoride to boot. Notice I didn't talk about fluoride yet. So there are good rinses out there. But when you start to teeter around the critical pH, Listerine Total Care Mouthwash, 5.4. Crest 3D White, 5.4. Crest Pro Health, 5.1. Floridex, 5.1. Now you're getting below the critical pH. These rinses that have fluoride, many of them need to be acidic to promote the uptake of the fluoride. So we need to think differently. Are these products enough? Is regular Crest enough for our regular patient? Maybe for the regular one, maybe not for the irregular one. If you want to look, if you want something commercial and you want something different, you might want to think here. Arm and Hammer plus enamel strengthening. Now, why this one in particular? If you look at the blue label at the bottom in the corner, it says, liquid calcium and fluoride. Now we're starting to get into the crux of where we're going when we talk about beating the disease, using not just fluoride, using other chemotherapeutics that will help assist in the process. So liquid calcium, which is in, in this theory here, ACP, is present in Arm & Hammer's toothpaste. The question, when I met with the people at Arm & Hammer, and the question that you should ask anybody when you walk through a trade show is how much bioavailable ACP, how much bioavailable liquid calcium is in your product? It's all well and good to stick it on the label, but does it do anything? Arm & Hammer's internal studies show true bioavailability of that liquid calcium. Now people say to me, what about the baking soda? Isn't it bad for you? Biggest myth ever in the world. What happens when you put baking soda in water? It dissolves. It's not going to do any harm to your teeth. Hit saliva, it's going to dissolve. The relative abrasion indexes are very low. So if you want a commercial product, don't just tell them Arm & Hammer, but tell them Arm & Hammer plus enamel strengthening. That's going to be more ideal. So I gave you a bunch of information. And again, I try to relate things to real life situations. You go to your physician and he takes a blood pressure on you and he gets a reading. It's high. What's the next thing he's gonna do to really know more about you? They're gonna run tests. We look at teeth. We pick up a mirror and explore, take an X-ray and their cavities. We typically don't run tests but there's a way to know more. GC makes a simple kit that allows us to know more. It's called Saliva Check. It's an examination tool for educating the patient and giving you more information how to plan that patient and combat disease. The kit has, the, has materials inside that allow you to check for pH, buffering capacity, quality, and quantity of your saliva. One of the things we didn't talk about yet, and I'm just gonna briefly mention is, we, we touched on it, is quantity of saliva. Saliva is a protectant. We have a lot of it, it's gonna flush. We have a little of it, it's not gonna do what it needs to do. So using some simple tools and tests, you're able to see what's going on with your patient. Let me bring you back to that 15 year old kid. If it was my patient and I tested that child with saliva check and the pH of his saliva was 4.1, I know that before I start anything, I'm fighting an uphill battle. And I need to support his saliva with chemotherapeutics or a chemotherapeutic program that will promote healing. At the same time, this is not an easy thing to fix. As I tell a parent, 
Your 15 year old's had these problems since he's three. I can't change it with one mouth rinse and a toothpaste. And I may need a variety of tactics in order to get that patient better, but you can get the patient better. So in the kit, we're able to test pH, important. There's a piece of litmus paper in there. You wanna spit in a cup and put the litmus paper into the cup. Do not put litmus paper into the mouth because it's toxic to humans. There's a strip that allows you to test for buffering capacity. What happens when that saliva experiences an acidic attack? Can it neutralize the attack? There's a cup where you can measure quantity, just spitting into the cup, resting hydration versus stimulated hydration, chewing on a piece of wax. You now have a test that allows you to become a, saliv a mini salivary expert. Well, you have acidic saliva, you're not producing a lot. We need to find ways for you to produce saliva, but also produce good saliva. We need to change that pH of that saliva. So how do we do that? We do it with a variety of chemotherapeutics, some of which GC has it all figured out, some of which you have to think about and go elsewhere. Understand another camera rule. Some things that work for one person will not work for the other. We're dealing with the body. The body is different. And when, I, and when I say that, it doesn't mean it's not gonna work at all, but it may not work fully. So you may have to supplement with other things. I don't wanna forget it, so I'm gonna say it out here, say it now. Anytime you can find a mouth rinse with arginine, arginine is an important killer of cariogenic causing plaque. There was a company that had a great arginine rinse. Unfortunately, they literally just stopped making the rinse. So we're looking for other mouth rinses with arginine. You can't find one in the drugstore. So you'll have to go online to try to find it. But if you find something with arginine, or Google arginine and caries, arginine is an important killer of cariogenic causing bacteria. What about that ideal product? The ideal chemotherapeutic, we want it to have a remineralization effect. We want it to have the ability to make bad teeth become better. We want to make sure that that material can buffer or help buffer in an acidic environment. Critical to the process is that chemotherapeutic be substantive in the oral cavity, because if it has a half-life and stays around, remember, keep in mind that that's, your mouth comes under acidic attacks on and off all day long. But if I had something that hung around for a few hours at a time, at least I could shrink that window where we have protection. If it could, it'd be great if we desensitized teeth because many of these patients have extreme sensitivity. And obviously we want something, not just something to bolster saliva, but we want something that would have some evidence-based studies to show support. So let's talk about Recaldin. What is Recaldin or CPP-ACP? CPP-ACP, casein phosphopeptide, amorphous calcium phosphate is a molecule that helps in remineralization. The CPP-ACP complex is a milk protein, it comes from a milk protein. And the CPP, which is casein phosphopeptide, acts as a holding bubble for the ACP. When that bubble comes under acidic attack, it releases the ACP right there and then when you need it. It's tacky, it's made from a milk protein. It functions as a remineralizer and as a desensitizer and an important part of the anti-caries process. Recaldent years ago commercially was available out there in certain chewing gums. And the first company, sounds pretty ironic, the first commercial company or food company that had the patent on Recaldent was good old Cadbury. Well, GC took that chemistry 
and they put it into products that you now know as today, MI Paste and MI Paste Plus, and a succession of products that has recaldent in it. So who would I use this chemotherapeutic cream on? Anybody who has white spot lesions, anybody who has sensitivity, even post tooth whitening, during and after orthodontics. Now most orthodontists today are still giving gel cam rinses and things like that, they're useless. They get white spots all the time. But use a substantive cream around those brackets or in your Invisalign trays and you can prevent or minimize caries. Anybody that's got dry mouth, an acidic oral environment or reflux, patient with poor plaque control, high caries risk patients, MI Paste and MI Paste Plus will provide protection. The difference, Plus has fluoride, MI Paste doesn't. Don't you have to just use MI Paste Plus because it has fluoride? No, MI Paste without fluoride will work well. So if you have your fluoride haters, don't worry, MI Paste will work well. GC brought MI Paste Plus out years ago, thinking that the calcium phosphate would interact with the fluoride and would enhance white spots in the remineralization process. Maybe it does. I've not found it that I've not found a clinical difference to see that. Traditionally, we use only MI paste, mostly because I have a lot of anti fluorides in my office. So we just use MI paste. I don't want to get, I don't want to fight that fight. I was on a plane one time going to the Yankee Dental meeting about an hour flight from New York, and I'm sitting, got upgraded to business class. A woman says to me, What do you do for a living? I don't know where I said, I'm a dentist. She goes, Are you going to the Yankee Dental meeting? I was like, Yeah, are you a dentist? She goes, No, what's your. What do you think about fluoride? I'm like, uh-oh, here we go. And, and I had to close my eyes because 45 minutes of hell was about to be stowed upon me with an anti-fluoride person sitting next to me. So don't get into the fluoride fight. You're going to lose every single time. How do you apply this product? Well, I think it depends what you're using it for. As a backup for anti-caries, meaning as a supplement for anti-caries, Brush your teeth before you go to bed, rinse your mouth, pea size them out on your finger, rub it into your teeth. You will look like the Got Milk commercial. You can swallow this, go to sleep, and you're good. If you want to treat white spots, you have to use a tray. Or if you want to use it post bleaching for extreme sensitivity, you should use a tray. Do not put this on a toothbrush, it's too tacky. It's, it's going to end up mostly in the bristles. So a finger, or a tray, depending what you're looking for. GC's not stupid. They're actually pretty smart. Their scientists are some of the best. They took this product and they lateraled it into other products within their arsenal. So if you're a believer in Recaldent and you're a believer in what I say, MI Paste One is a toothpaste that has Recaldent inside, and MI Varnish which is a fluoride varnish has recaldent inside. The evolution from 2004 through 2017 allowed for a complete series of products that have the recaldent factors in there going on. So you could stay in family if you feel comfortable with these materials. I told you you need evidence-based studies. I can talk till tomorrow and tell you clinically and anecdotally, but you do need evidence-based studies. This, was, this study was done in, in evaluating the, the ethic, efficacy of CPP, ACP in reducing salary strep mutant levels. And although all agents were effective, the CPP, ACP showed the highest reduction in strep mutant over six months. Remember that strep mutant is not the only player, but it did work there. Another study, evidence suggests minimally invasive treatment modalities of white spot lesions produce significant improvement in the appearance and regression of white spots following treatment when with MI paste as compared to control or placebo. So MI paste will work well for white spots. Probably the hardest thing for most GPs to treat are white spots because your options are limited depending on how young the patient could be. Someone walks in and they're 35 years old and they hate their white spots 
and Hugh wants to put a dozen veneers on there, I do it all the time. I, we can do it all for it. But if someone's young and you're going to do something conservative and you're going to remove that white spot, little micro abrasion doesn't come out all the way. Now you pick up a burr. What happens when you start drilling into a white spot? They get whiter. Now you put a composite over it and you have a beautiful composite with a little bit of white showing through because you want it to be conservative. What happens if you bleach those white spots? Everything gets whiter. So now you have whiter spots on whiter teeth. So I'm gonna show you a foolproof technique that each and every one of you can do. I've done this hundreds of times with ideal results. And unlike my colleagues, I will not pick up a burr or a handpiece in this case. I'm gonna show you how Kaminer grew enamel and reversed white spots. And if I can do it, everybody can do it. Now, from a chemotherapeutic perspective, the case I'm gonna show you, it was done with MI paste. And I'm doing another one now with MI paste and another did one a month ago with MI paste. I've done them with Remin Pro from Voco. I have a great case or two with that. And I've done it with enamel on from Premier. Remin Pro from Voco, the cream looks the same but the chemistry is different. The only one that's got CPPACP is MI paste. Reminpro from Voco has calcium, phosphate, fluoride, and xylitol. And Enamelon's got stannous fluoride, calcium, and phosphate. So different chemistry, they can all work. I think my easiest and best success has always been MI paste. But the technique is the same, no matter which chemotherapeutic you use. So the patient comes in and says, Doc, I hate my white spots. I read on the internet, you wrote an article, and you can fix it. And by the way, if you forget this technique, Google Ron Kaminer and white spots. The article is on there. There's a few of them. Your technique will be there for you. So the first thing we got to do is get what I call the schmutz off the teeth. We need to get the plaque off the teeth. So we're going to profi the teeth, profi paste, get all the junk off the teeth. Next step, we're going to take... Still today, impressions, upper and lower alginates. We use Kettenbach silginate. It's an alginate substitute. It's dimensionally stable. It's a great material. My assistant is off to the lab pouring models. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to use a smaller amount of chemical microabrasion. This is a product from Ultradent, and it's called Opaluster. Opaluster is a 6.6% hydrochloric acid slurry. If you read the instructions in Ultradent, it will say 30 seconds to a minute on each white spot. It comes with its own like profi cup, firm profi cup to use. If you do that, you will abrade an enamel and you will have a flattened tooth. My goal here is just to open up the enamel pores to allow penetration of the chemotherapeutics. So we're going to go 15 to 20 seconds on each tooth. Very lightly, whatever comes off great, I want to open up the enamel pores. Realize that this hydrochloric acid can be damaging and caustic to the tissue. So you want to use either, either liquid rubber dam, cotton rolls, or, or a rubber dam to protect the tissue. And I always say, follow what I call the mother-in-law rule. These are rules I used to give my mother-in-law when you use this product. Don't press too hard and don't stay too long. Because if you do that, you're going to ruin teeth. So about 15 seconds per tooth, open the enamel pores. We rinse that off. We'll then apply 37% phosphoric acid, blue etch, to the teeth for 30 seconds. What am I doing? I am further demineralizing those demineralized areas. I'll rinse that off. And now I'll take my glove finger, I'll apply MI paste to the area. My assistant's in the lab. She poured models. She's already made bleaching trays. I'm sending the patient home with the trays and MI paste, and I'm telling them they have to wear a tray with MI paste for at least one hour per day till I see them again, which is going to be the following week. If it's kids, they come home from school, they brush their teeth, they eat snack, they brush their teeth, they put their tray in. They want to sleep with them, they can sleep with them. I don't care how they do it. Clean teeth, tray goes in with MI paste for an hour. That's visit one. 
Visit two, no more opal luster. Opal luster is only used initially to spark the process. But on visit two, in perpetuity, till you're done with the case, 37% phosphoric acid for 30 seconds, followed by the application of MI paste in the office, sending them home with a tray. Now, these cases can take six weeks, eight weeks, 20 weeks, 30 weeks. I don't know how fast the teeth are going to absorb the cream. When we see about 50 to 60% remineralization, we will then tell the patient they can whiten their teeth to blend things in, still doing the MI paste at home. And you finish it. When they look good, they're done. Let me take you through a case because I think it'll blow you away. This is Brianna. Brianna came to me, divorced family. She was teased in school. This case goes back now 10 years. Teased in school. They called her Swiss cheese mouth because she had holes in her front teeth like Swiss cheese. Her father wanted me to do fillings on her front teeth because she was teased. And I said, wait a minute. Let me try something before I do this. Let's try to close the holes. I, my first case I ever did. So you can see here on the canines, she's got big holes, centrals, holes, 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 all over the place. She's got defects in the enamel. Same thing I just told you. Profier teeth, alginates. Opal luster. We have cotton rolls up there. Light abrading into the teeth. Rinse it off. 37% phosphoric acid. Why am I covering the whole tooth with phosphoric acid? Because the whole tooth is damaged. If there's only one white spot, I'd only put it on the one white spot. That's what it looks like after opal luster and etch. You could see severe demineralization. You could see the holes, even the hole here. With, I left some etch in here in the, this picture. You could see the holes in place. This patient was instructed to use MI paste as much as possible, but no less than 30 minutes a day. You can't overdose on this stuff. We, we did exactly what I told you. Week two, etch, MI paste in perpetuity. Here's what she looks like at week eight. We already begun to see closure of the holes. The canines are lagging. The centrals are looking good. And she says to me, any chance I can whiten my teeth? They look so much better. I want to whiten them. I'm like, Brianna, you're playing along with the program. I'm good. Let's do that. So... At the time, we used ultra-dense tray white, which is equivalent to go whitening today. Either prefabricated trays with carbamide peroxide inside. It's available in 6% mint, 10% mint, melon, and peach, and 15% mint. We used a 10% at the time on her. Here's what she looks like in 10 weeks. 10 weeks, I did not pick up a handpiece. I didn't drill anything. All I did was use creams and gels to close holes. I took her from a dental cripple to a dental miracle. The canines were still lagging. At 14 weeks, I wanted to take the final picture. They don't show up. They look good. The good news is they eventually showed up. 29 month post-op, two and a half year post-op on this case. Shows the holes have not recurred. Canines are now looking good. Color went back a little bit, but if you look close, teeth still look great. Not bad, right? How about an eight-year post-op? Look at those canines. Look at those centrals. Never picked up a handpiece. Etch, opal luster, trays, <coughs> whitening, and M I paste. CPP, ACP, paste alone did not significantly improve the fluorescence value of white spot lesions. With the limitation of this study, microabrasion treatment with or without CPP improved the fluorescence and thus reduced the white spot lesions. So you do need support according to the study. CPP, ACP therapy for at least 12 weeks is highly recommended as a post-orthodontic treatment needed for the management of smooth surface white spot lesions. There is studies behind this. But if I can do it, you can do it. Let's give you some final thoughts. 
CPPACP is an important remineralization agent, cavity fighter, and an important piece to our arsenal. When used in a proper protocol, as you saw, it can reverse white spot lesions without the need to pick up a drill. And there's other CPPACP products in the family that can be used to assist in caries control. With that, Pete, hope you guys enjoyed. I'm going to pass the, the baton back to Pete. And um, it's been a fun morning. So I got a couple of questions that people have asked that I have a couple of questions that we'll ask. Uh, first of all, someone asked, Ron, how do you come up with a fee for something like this? Because it's such a variable technique as to how much time you spend on it. It's a great question. It's a common question that I get. So for me, a fee is a crooked word, right? It's, it's what, you will, what, what you're willing to charge for that particular procedure that particular time, or what that patient is willing to pay for that procedure that particular time. You know, we typically, these cases are not huge money makers. I mean, they are in the sense it's all profit, but it's 15 minutes of chair time, could be many weeks. We charge them, we used to charge three grand, now we charge four grand for these. If it's six weeks, I win. If it's 40 weeks, I lose. I'm okay with losing if I get a result like that. So that's how we really do it. Hmm. To that question though, Pete, some people say to me, four grand for bleach and MI paste and etch? And my answer is no, it's for the care, skill and judgment that we didn't cut down your kid's teeth. That's what they're paying for. And the time is spent and creating the protocol. So I, I used one of those techniques a long time ago. It wasn't the GC, it was another brand, and it was a disaster. And it's because I didn't know the right protocol to use. And I don't think the company did it at the time either. So I think it's really a good idea to check out your, your page again. What do you just, you just Google your name? Yeah, if you Google Ron Cameron or White Spots, there'll be a few articles floating around the internet. Okay. All right, so Ron and, um, and Lou should be there. So I have a couple of questions for both of them. Uh, and here's one for, for both of you. Now, you, you use 37% etching for these cases. What do you think of the new high viscosity etchants on the market now by Bisco and by Vista Apex? So, listen, for me, etch is etch if it works. Do I like the viscous etch because it stays a little better? Yes. My concern in these situations, if you have holes, you, they're going to sit in there a little bit. So you have to really push to get them out. So I do like the viscous etch, I think it's a, it's a good angle to change the viscosity, but you do have to be careful on rinsing things out very, very thoroughly because they do hang around. I love doing this tag team. So what do you think? if dentists want to do a selective etch, I really believe you need a viscous etch, Pete, because openly right. it's a controlled etching. So people who don't want to etch dentin, only enamel, I love both companies viscous etch love that um the other aspect that ron just mentioned what we do we surgically suction first before rinsing so we'll surgically suction then the assistant uses a larger suction and then we just rinse but openly i prefer guided etching than just running etching okay uh this is my question um you talked before about especially when you're using uh, flowable composites or injectable composites you need to um, light cure them for quite some time. What do you think of the new laser light, the Monet light that's on the market and the new pink laser that supposedly cures much faster and cures the bottom of the box better? So I, I, Ron and I will both have fun with this. So first off, the question is, does fast curing create more stress and strain? That's the first question. Okay, so you get a complete cure potentially faster. I get that. But does it create more stress and strain on the adjacent tooth? I mean, we all know that if you have a self-curing composite, it creates less stress and strain when curing. That's why I think when I'm doing a delivery with resin cements in the posterior, I love dual cure because you can almost let it you, you have less stress and less strain. So I, I do look at it that way. The other thing I'm always concerned about is if you say, okay, you can cure the bottom of a box in three seconds and your light isn't angled exactly right, you're gonna under cure. So per my feeling is I'd rather over cure. Yeah, you can add seconds to that, but openly, I think it'll be interesting to see if there's any more stress 
uh, and strain on these type of uh, quick cures. Ron? Uh, so I've not used the Monet light. My understanding is it's extremely, extremely hot. And heat with these lights, I think, is always yep. a concern, not just for the pulp, but also for the surrounding soft tissues. But I've heard that light is extremely hot. You know, lights are probably one of the most technological, taken advantage of products from dentistry. Where can you get a light? Go on eBay. It's from China. Everything cures on top, right? The question is what happens below? And I think that a good, reputable light with long-term studies can make or break your restoration. Does the pink wave look interesting? It does. Absolutely. It's been around two years. Talk to me in five years. You know, am I willing to be the pioneer in most things? Yes. Do I have a pink wave? Yes. Do I use it more than my Velo? Not yet. Mm -hmm. okay. They do have some of the best marketing out there because uh, AMD markets the Monet light by saying it prevents soggy bottoms, which means the bottom of the box. Right. Whatever. Okay, Lou, question for you. Um, GC triplac gel, triplac gel, uh, ID gel. Yeah. What do you think of it? I think it is the must have gel. Now, why is a disclosing gel important? Okay, in the old gels, you would just basically disclosing plaque, you would just try to see where the plaque was. Well, there they have a unique gel. They first off, it has sucrose in it. So when you rinse the tri plaque gel away, you get three different colors. And the three different colors will either display high acidogenic bacterial plaque, which means the patient's at high risk, which goes back to Ron's whole course today, it'll show old plaque where the patient has been missing over 24 hours or new plaque. New plaque's easy. So I think it starts to also co-diagnose is a patient caries prone? Are they missing areas more than 24 hours or do they just miss it this morning? And I, or this whatever. So I do think the tri plaque gel is an absolute in every hygiene operatory. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Peter. Take care, guys.